So, ladies and gentlemen, let's start uh, right away. And this uh, second uh, session on health is uh, uh, entitled Global Governance and, and Public Health. Um, and let me just say as an introduction that issues of governance of health and governance for health have become uh, particularly prominent on the international agenda with the COVID pandemic and not least, of course, uh, because of the increasing geopolitical dimension of global health. New challenges have emerged around vaccine nationalism, vaccine and mask diplomacy, access to supply chains and intellectual property waivers. And as the pandemic progressed, health moved from being a sort of a soft power agenda to becoming a critical economic and security issue and took up large parts of the deliberations of regional summits like the European Council, the G20, the G7, the World Trade Organization. No meeting of G7, G20 or European Council in the last two years wasn't including or having as a dominant component uh, the issue of health. The uh, independent panel on pandemic preparedness and response, of which both Anders Nordstrom and myself were, were part, in our report in May 2021, we had come up with a number of recommendations. And within in the, those recommendations, one was about governance and suggesting that in order to, for the world to be better prepared for the future, we need to elevate the uh, level of leadership to prepare and respond to global health threats. And one of the suggestions that the panel uh, put forward was the establishment of what we call a Global Health Threats Council, <coughs> if you wish, some sort like a, a Security Council uh, for, uh, for health threats, uh, something similar to what had been negotiated uh, on, uh, in the nu nuclear field after the Chernobyl uh, catastrophe to ensure accountable and multi-sectoral action in the future. We also discussed the to strengthen and uh, WHO in its independency and capacity to uh, react to, to an emergency. Several of the recommendations of this panel were overlapping with recommendations from other groups, such as the uh, G20 high-level group on pandemic finance and the so-called Monty uh, Commission. Uh, in, in Europe. So where are we today uh, with these uh, discussions and uh, negotiations? Well, first, negotiations have now started in Geneva at multilateral level on revising the so-called international healthcare health regulations and on a new pandemic, a new binding pandemic treaty uh, following a resolution of the World Health Assembly in November last year. Second, the US, together with a number of other countries and the World Bank, have called on the establishment and have actually launched a new pandemic financing facility uh, on the way for which there are pros and cons. Maybe we'll uh, discuss that later. And third, uh, the General Assembly of the U UN has called on a special session of the UN General Assembly on Pandemic Preparedness and Response, which will be held in 2023. And if you remember, it was the uh, first uh, special session, high-level session of the UN General Assembly in 2001 on HIV AIDS that really was the turning point mobilizing the world against the AIDS pandemic, and also a special session of the UN General Assembly on Ebola in 2014 that brought the issue at the highest level of 
public and political awareness. So we're looking forward to very much to the uh, ongoing negotiations now already of a political resolution at that special session of the UN. But also, as we work now at global level, um, and most importantly, uh, I believe, structural, institutional, and political changes are occurring at regional level. Um, and uh, as we heard from Juliette during the, the pandemic, the African Union, uh, behind, uh, united somehow behind President Ramaphosa and uh, a continental plan to, uh, to procure vaccines and pandemic goods, uh, we saw the emergence of a remarkable African CDC that took leadership at both continental and, and global levels, and the EU uh, created an African regulatory agency for medicines on the model of the FDA or the EMA. So uh, let us now discuss uh, these issues at global and regional level, and we have a, a great panel today with uh, Anders uh, Nordström, Ambassador for Global Health from Sweden, uh, who may also maybe say a word about the uh, forthcoming Swedish presidency of the, of the Union. Uh, Dr. Aruka Sakamoto, uh, Senior Fellow at the National Graduate Institute for Policy Studies in Tokyo, who is online. Uh, good morning, uh, Aruka, and thank you for being again with us. Dr. Farida al Hosseini, who is the spokesperson on health from UAE. Uh, Lionel Zinsu, uh, co-chair of Southbridge, chair of Terra Nova, and former prime minister of uh, Benin. And finally, uh, Jacques Bio, former president of Ecole Polytechnique in France, whom uh, I have asked somehow to provide a, a perspective from I call him an informed outsider at the, at the end of our discussion. So let's start right away and maybe with you, Anders. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Uh, delighted to be here today. Um, let me just look back. Somebody was asking whether we are better prepared today uh, than what we were in the past. In 2006, I was the acting director general then for the World Health Organization. I was at the G8 meeting in St. Petersburg. No one knew, of course, who I was, uh, but President Bush took me to the Chinese president during the coffee break and told him, you better tell this man, the health man, if you have an outbreak of a disease. This was in 2006. Are we more prepared, better prepared today? The panel, the previous panel, came out with a one-year report called Transforming or Tinkering, and the answering was that the world is still tinkering. I would like to say a few words about the lessons, uh, what we have learned in, in terms of governance in different dimensions, global governance, regional governance, governance across sectors and across both private and public partners. Then a few words, as Michelle said, about the regionalization and what that means in terms of what we still need to do at the global level. And then finally, a few words, as again Michelle was indicating, what is happening right now in terms of global processes and how can we collectively make sure that those are successful and more successful than in the past. So if we look back at the lessons to start with, uh, again, as Michelle and the previous panel was saying, the world was warned. And the way that we had to measure whether the world was prepared did not work. If we look at the graph, Countries with the highest scores did the worst, had the highest numbers of deaths. So the way that the world had listened to previous reports, suggestions, we reviewed 16 previous com commissions and panels, and the recommendations had been made, but the world had not taken action. First lesson, this time we need to take action. Second was, and again, as was indicated here before, that the international alarm system, the surveillance system, did not work effectively enough. China reported 48 hours after the, when they should have reported. According to the international regulation, it should be done in 24 hours. So 48 instead of 24. But that was not the big problem. The big problem was then three weeks later when WHO's director general had the advisory committee to come in and to advise, they did not agree. Took another week before the director general said, here we have a public health emergence of international concern. 
30th of January. But now we have the big problem. The world did not understand what that meant. So the international alarm system did not work. 30th of January. Then we lost another six weeks before he used the word pandemic on the 10th of, May, oh, 10th of March. Then the world reacts. And at that time, we had lost basically, uh, and most importantly, the whole month of February. So the international system is not about just alarming and empowering WHO to do that, but it's a way that the international we basically understand what that alarm system means. Third, uh, we did 28 country studies, looking at some of the best countries and some of the worst countries. And I'm not going to go into this. This is published in international literature. Uh, but this is about governance. And if we looked at some of the best performing countries, we spoke about four Cs. And that had to do with good governance at the national level in between different ministries, but also working across private and public, working with communities. I would say South Korea was possibly one of the best examples of having an early aggressive containment strategy. And then you had governments where we classified them as the four Ds, that they evaluated, uh, created distrust among people, uh, and I don't think I need to name the countries that did the worst, that basically devaluated the whole, uh, the whole challenge. The fourth lesson was, again, what has been discussed here, that was about diagnostics and vaccines. And um, the genetic sequence was chaired then on the 10th of January. Rep it's never been done so quickly before it was published in the international journal. And we have not had a vaccine being developed so quickly, but not just one, but a number of vaccines. So that was a big success, so a lot of lessons. But the big failure was, of course, the access to the vaccines. And not just from an equity perspective, but from an effective public health perspective. Did we use the vaccines and diagnostic in the most effective way to stop the pandemic as quickly as possible? The simple answer is no. Next time we need to do better, not just get the vaccines, the volumes, but using them in a more effective way to be able to stop the pandemic quicker. So those are some of the lessons. Second dimension to this is also what has happened here is that we have a much stronger regionalization, I would say politically generally, but also of health. When I was the head of the WHO country office during the Ebola outbreak in Sierra Leone, the African CDC did not exist when I left in 2017. Today, it's a power. <coughs> the African Union, what we have seen happening here during just the last years, is a totally different situation. As Michel said, from the European side, the European Commission presented now a new strategy for global health. I was there in Brussels, and when Sweden takes on the presidency for the European Union or the European Council next year, we will also ensure that there is political support uh, for a new strategy, a new direction for global health. But with stronger regions, and it's not just in Africa and Europe, it's also here in the Middle East, it's in Asia, what does it mean in terms of global? actions, global responsibilities, because that agenda needs to change. I don't think we need a global platform for vaccines in the future, but we need stronger regional platforms, but we still need global cooperation, sharing information, data, but also ways of working the management the flow of then access to products. So we need to rethink the global functions based on that we have stronger regions today. Are we ready? No, we are not ready, as I said. And uh, Michel, you were saying that there are two major sort of processes happening now. One set of processes in Geneva, a new treaty, and in New York, a potential then political agreement. Both of those are extremely difficult and cumbersome. It's going too slow. The political environment right now is not the best. We need all support from you, from people across the world, from both private and public, saying that we need certain political decisions, we need certain rules. We need to empower WHO to share information quickly. We need ways of engaging across private and public to be able to have access to resources and tools more rapidly in the future. So we need both the rules that are basically negotiated in Geneva, and we need also the political commitment that is our hope that we will have from this meeting in New York. Two critical things to this, those agendas. One is about this platform to access the, what we call the medical countermeasures, the vaccines, the diagnostics, etc., and then the financing of that. And the second one is then the suggestion from the panel of, of also establishing some sort of platform with senior leaders 
from both potentially both private and public to be able to be the sounding board to problem solve if something like this is happening so we don't have the very bad situation when we had at the beginning of the pandemic when the US and China couldn't agree on anything basically. So the need for a platform where we can work across regions and sectors. Let me finish Jan, just, by, by, just to say that this pandemic is still not just about the virus. It's not only about getting the vaccines. This pandemic, as again Michelle was saying initially, has been about economies. It's been people losing their jobs. It's been about children not having access to school. And we have not seen the impact of this yet. So for the future, we need to think about that we have countries, systems, commitments at all levels national, regional, globally, that is not only focusing on making sure we get the vaccines, but that we have national system, international system, that can also deal with those broader challenges, because that is what we've seen. And I can't help saying then something at the end that might be a bit surprising, because somebody was mentioning nutrition. Uh, one of the critical factors, whether you were successful or whether you had um, a number of, you lost a number of lives, was actually the rate of obesity. If you look at the US, the most important factor whether you were at high risk was obesity. Mm -hmm. So if you speak now about climate and what we need to do in terms of changing our food system, it's about climate, but it's also about health. And the biggest epidemic we have in the world today is actually obesity. And that is all in some way should trigger thinking that this is more than just a virus. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, excellent. <coughs> So let's um, thank you, Anders, for setting the scene. Uh, and maybe I'll first turn to you, uh, Lionel, um, because Africa has obviously come as one of the uh, regions that, um, despite its diversity, and uh, um, really came together in an amazing way in response to the pandemic. And could you elaborate on that and uh, share a few thoughts on whether global governance will be regional governance, still has to be global in the future, and could be about health, but why not about all other issues that we deal with uh, here at the WPC? Merci, Monsieur le Président. Vous m'autorisez à parler en français? Mais bien sûr, oui. <laughs> Merci. Alors, En fait, vous m'avez demandé de me dédoubler et de ne pas être que moi-même dans ce panel. Et vous avez eu tout à fait raison parce que un de mes collègues qui était très attaché à être présent aujourd'hui, Michel Sidibé, ancien ministre de la Santé de la République du Mali, mais surtout euh, très marquant euh, responsable patron d'ONU-SIDA, euh, ne pouvait pas être là physiquement, mais voulait être là euh, intellectuellement. Donc il m'a demandé de partager quelques messages qui vont tout à fait dans le même sens que ce que notre excellent collègue vient de dire. L'Union africaine a été complètement différente en 2020-2021 de ce qu'on pouvait penser et de ce qu'elle avait été auparavant et est un exemple assez remarquable euh, d'une réponse rapide et assez Prometteuse. Alors, Michel Sidibé me demande euh, de vous dire que la situation est très préoccupante, au sens où nous ne sommes absolument pas prêts pour les évolutions, et en même temps assez prometteuse, au sens où il y a eu beaucoup d'innovations, notamment de gouvernance, dans la période euh, actuelle, enfin, qui vient de prévaloir pendant trois ans. Il me demande d'attirer votre attention sur un certain nombre de chiffres euh, symboliques, mais, mais quand même assez éclairants. L'Afrique n'est rien en matière de production, de distribution, d'administration, de capacité d'accès aux médicaments, aux traitements et aux équipements. Je vais quand même beaucoup. C'est-à-dire que même si l'utilisation des vaccins en Afrique est devenue importante, 1% de ces vaccins sont produits par l'Afrique elle-même. Même si il y a un développement important, récent, 
des traitements et de la consommation de médicaments, 95 des consommations de médicaments sont importées sur le continent africain. C'est évidemment un record. En revanche, là où il y a des sujets proches du crime organisé, d'après l'OMS, 40% des volumes de faux médicaments dans le monde concernent le continent africain. Et on a clairement donc un système de santé publique, mais qui n'est pas simplement l'administration des soins, qui est la prévention, qui est la répartition pharmaceutique, l'accès aux médicaments, qui est l'équipement, qui est et reste profondément défaillant. Pour vous donner une idée, le marché pharmaceutique mondial, dans les chiffres de, de Michel, est de l'ordre de 1,4 trillion de dollars, 1400 milliards de dollars. Le marché médicaments de l'industrie pharmaceutique en Afrique est un peu inférieur à 1 milliard de dollars. On est très en dessous d'un millième pour un continent qui rassemble quand même 18% de la population du monde. Donc on est véritablement devant des chiffres qui indiquent une situation extrêmement préoccupante. Et pourtant, quels sont les éléments prometteurs Ils sont précisément dans l'évolution de la gouvernance. Il est vrai qu'on avait la chance d'avoir en 2020, comme président de l'Union africaine, le président du pays le plus avancé, quels que soient les paramètres en termes d'équipement, d'accès aux soins, de laboratoire, de répartition pharmaceutique. Et il est vrai que, indépendamment de la gouvernance de santé publique, et donc une réponse euh, rapide, il y a eu aussi dans le domaine de la dette, euh, il y a eu aussi donc dans le domaine des conséquences économiques de la pandémie, des réponses euh, également rapides et, 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 et efficaces. Michel Sidibé est chargé de créer l'Agence africaine des médicaments, qui va être un progrès très important. Aujourd'hui, sur 55 pays membres de l'Union africaine, deux sont considérés comme ayant des agences nationales du médicament qui soient de niveau international. Il y a un classement de l'OMS, deux, celle de l'Égypte, celle de la République d'Afrique du Sud, sont au sommet de, des qualifications. Ça laisse 53 pays qui sont en deçà de, de ce niveau. De créer cette agence, et il est envoyé spécial de l'Union africaine pour la créer, est très significative. Elle sera à Kigali avec un support politique important. Ce sera une façon de prolonger tout ce qui a été dit du CDC, qui a été salué je crois par vous, qui a été salué dans le panel précédent comme étant une institution qui a permis d'harmoniser beaucoup de choses en Afrique très très vite pendant la pandémie en 2020. Ça ira aussi dans le sens des plateformes numériques qui ont été mises au point extraordinairement vite avec le secteur privé à l'initiative de l'Union africaine et qui ont permis d'importer tout ce qu'on pouvait importer à des prix très bas, parce que c'était des plateformes numériques permettant d'avoir une vision complète des prix, en s'affranchissant des lourdeurs des marchés publics et en ayant des marchés continentaux et non pas des marchés par pays, et en ayant un mécanisme automatique de paiement financé par Afreximbank, Bank, c'est-à-dire un dispositif d'une efficacité incroyable. Efficacité incroyable, sauf que ce qui était incroyable, c'est qu'il n'y avait pas, dans beaucoup de domaines, notamment de, 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 de la vaccination, d'offres disponibles. C'était différent pour les équipements, les respirateurs, les masques, etc. Mais pour les vaccins, on a eu quelque chose qui, j'imagine, va être l'objet du traité sur la pandémie, un protectionnisme incroyable, et l'Afrique a été la grande victime du non-accès en réalité, au vaccin. Mais du point de vue de la gouvernance et de l'efficience, on a eu une réponse très complète 
et tout de même extrêmement rapide, puisqu'elle était opérationnelle à l'automne de, de 2020. Je n'ai rien à ajouter à ces deux constats. C'est très préoccupant, mais assez prometteur en termes d'institution et plus que l'institution de passage à l'acte, si ce n'est que je crois qu'il faut, sou... enfin, faut souligner que le secteur privé, vous avez évoqué l'idée qu'il y aurait de la coproduction de la gouvernance avec le secteur privé, ou le secteur, disons, euh, associatif des grandes fondations, ou la capacité de réaction du Fonds mondial qui a inscrit le Covid très, très rapidement dans ses priorités à côté des autres grandes pandémies. C'est aussi tout un secteur très important. Et juste un témoignage comme banquier d'affaires, comme financier aujourd'hui, évidemment, il y a une mobilisation importante de fonds et le secteur privé réagit avec des perspectives d'investissement très très significative dans l'ensemble des compartiments du health care, de la santé publique et, et, et évidemment sur les vaccins. Mais là encore, nous, nous travaillons par exemple avec la fondation Bill et Melinda Gates parce qu'il nous faut des moyens d'ensemencement financier, de seed money. Et avec la fondation Gates, on est en train de les déployer pour créer un tissu de PME, parce qu'il y a beaucoup de PME, euh, des cliniques aux répartiteurs euh, de pharmacie, il y a dans le secteur privé beaucoup de ressources, sauf les ressources financières, sauf les ressources en capital. Et aujourd'hui, c'est un compartiment important de, du développement financier. Merci le secteur beaucoup. privé existe. Merci. Merci. Merci beaucoup. Euh, J'aimerais dire ici que les évaluations à la fois du panel financier du G20 et de notre panel indépendant euh, sont euh, que pour la préparation euh, aux pandémies, les besoins seraient de l'ordre de 15 milliards par an, avec la possibilité aussi d'avoir une sorte de réserve immédiatement mobilisable de 50 à 100 milliards euh, je ne vais pas rentrer dans les détails, mais ces sommes sont évidemment, comme vous l'avez souligné, M. Zinzou, sans comparaison avec les 22 milliards de milliards euh, du coût estimé de la pandémie euh, sur les années 2020-2025. Uh, we, we spoke about... Um, um, Anders mentioned the presidency of the European uh, Union. Uh, next year is also the, the year where Japan will host the G7. And of course, pandemics have been very high on the G7 agenda for the last few years. So maybe, uh, Aruka, uh, can, can I turn to, to you now? Thank you. Okay, yes. Hi, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity today. <coughs> So the, uh, today, I'd like to talk about more like the security perspective for the global health, especially for the medical countermeasures. So the COVID-19 pandemic is now nearly three years, and then its socioeconomic impact has been so significant that it would have been become clear that public health crisis like a global pandemic would lead to a national security. So while so-called non-pharmaceutical interventions are, of course, essential, uh, the game changers are likely to be vaccine diagnostics and therapeutics, the so-called medical countermeasures, or MCM. At the same time, the political global security risk of medical countermeasures became clear again. So in general, when considering the value chain of MCMs, the flow can be divided into the three parts, the upstream, midstream, and downstream part. The upstream part is a surveillance or intelligence function which is to quickly grasp the information in the event of some infectious disease outbreak. The midstream corresponds to actual research and development, and the final downstream part involves clinical trials, regulatory approval, manufacturing, procurement, and allocation of the MCMs. The important point is that such an MCM value chain cannot be completed in a single country. In the past, the semiconductor industry has shifted from a vertically integrated model in which a single major company was responsible for the entire value chain to a horizontal division of labor. Similarly, the pharmaceutical industry is also shifting from a vertically integrated model to a horizontal division of labor, 
in which each process is divided into separate companies and organizations. The horizontal division of labor was also the mainstream in the vaccine production during the COVID-19. And then this type of production structure will continue to be the mainstream for rapid vaccine R&D in the future. At the same time, it is a quite important how to establish and diversify a value chain system that can be completed among like-minded companies. As I said previously that MCM value chain cannot be completed in any one country. In particular, the since access to the vaccine is in a matter that directly affects the lives of its own citizens, it is a very important security matter for any country and the geopolitical risks should be reduced as much as possible when securing MCMs for their own citizens. So, for example, currently the raw material for all kinds of medicines are mainly dependent on China and then India. In other words, it is presently quite challenging to complete in any pharmaceutical value chain without China and then India. It will become more important to complete a diversified supply chain, taking into account the cost and an environment impact. Also, in addition to the security perspective, in the case of a pandemic on the scale of COVID-19, there's the issue of how to prepare the capacity to manufacture vaccines for the entire population on a global scale. Local production of COVID-19 vaccines took place outside of Western countries, mainly India, Africa, and Asian countries. Without the manufacturing capacity of these countries, it would not have been possible to rapidly manufacture and distribute as many vaccines worldwide as it did for the COVID-19. And technological transfer is critical during the global pandemic. On the other hand, technological transfer to low and middle income country is not always easy, mainly due to the intellectual property rights. In the past, even if Western countries developed new pharmaceuticals, the transfer of technology to low and middle income countries was limited because they had been a strong stance for protection of intellectual property rights. And then there was an absolute gap in access to pharmaceuticals between high income and low and middle income countries. This time of COVID-19, China has really turned the power structure. They actively provided the COVID-19 vaccine to countries that traditionally would not have had access to Western medicine due to price issues by offering home ground vaccines at a lower price and actively transfer technologies. So in the field of pharmaceuticals, which is a major industry for many countries, there is a desire to continue to protect the industry through the intellectual property rights, but there are also moves to restrain rulemaking by China and this field. So how to handle IP and technology transfer, especially in times of emergency, will continue to be an important issue to be considered. So in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic, there is a trend toward shifting the coordination body from the global level to the global level. So the status of the each region was already introduced by the other panelists, uh, but in the area of pandemic control, including R&D for new medical countermeasures, is expected to be controlled jointly at the regional level. So regarding the regional level, but it should be noted here that in Asia, where Japan is located, is a complicated region to establish a single regional body. So, for example, the WHO has a six regional office, but Asia is an only region where the WHO has a two regional office because of the historical and political reasons. Also, Asia includes larger countries in terms of population size and economy, such as Japan, China, Korea, Australia, and India, as well as in smaller countries with smaller populations, such as in island nations. So, while we generally have the coordination by the regional body or at the regional level, how to unite Asia in terms of the pandemic control will be a major issue in the future. So the G7 presidency in the UK focused on R&D for the medical countermeasures, and the Germany G7 focused on the intelligence and human resource for pandemic preparedness. So the G7 in Japan, which will start soon, is expected to focus on the global health governance, including the promotion of regional bodies and the pharmaceutical R&D and innovations based on the discussion in the UK and Germany or the full agenda is not yet known. The G7 summit will be held in the Hiroshima and the G7 health ministers meeting will be in Nagasaki. Both cities experience in the public health crisis is a different sense than infectious diseases, namely the health hazards caused by the atomic bombs. And both are symbol cities of the peace. 
So I hope that the Japanese government will actively lead the discussion in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the cities of the peace, on how we should confront the global health challenges amid increasing challenges that continue to threaten our lives based on our lessons from the COVID-19. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Haruka, for these perspectives and also uh, giving us already a, a flavor of, of the forthcoming G7. Can I now, Dr. Farida, turn to you um, with a perspective from the Emirates and Thank the region? Thank you. It's really a very interesting and very important discussion that we have regarding uh, the global governance uh, and being more prepared uh, to pandemics. I think that uh, uh, there is a lot to be done. Uh, there are six main uh, priority areas that we need to focus on, starting from the uh, leadership commitment. And I see that the global conversation to revise the governance structure is really going on, but it is slower compared to the rest of having a new global pandemic which is existing uh, to all uh, to all of us uh, at uh, the global level but also at, at the regional level i think the imro region is uh, very uh, unique in terms of the structure we have a, a wide disparity of economics we have major insecurity uh, uh, and uh, political instability in certain areas of our region that really increase uh, the risk of outbreaks and also also increase the risk of any future pandemics. So in terms of leadership uh, commitment, I see that uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic was a, a very interesting lesson to uh, the political leadership across the world because of the huge impact uh, to uh, not only to the health, but also to the economics and to the political systems across the world. However, we need also to realize that some of the challenges that we faced are really uh, uh, constraints for the uh, com uh, global community to work uh, together in collaborative approach. We could see, uh, for example, uh, nationalism towards vaccines, which prevented us from uh, good access to different vaccinations. So in terms of the global governance systems, we need to think of what are the priorities that we need to focus on. And um, the uh, having strong healthcare systems is one of the critical issues. We know and we understand understand that there are fragile healthcare systems in certain uh, countries and certain regions, but we cannot really uh, afford those uh, systems to affect uh, uh, the global uh, health security in terms of emerging in new diseases. So we need to work together to uh, strengthen those healthcare systems in the minimum requirements in terms of the disease surveillance, in terms of the access to care, and in terms of the vaccination. I think my colleagues covered vaccination uh, very uh, um, comprehensively. I would like to add to that the uh, access to immunotherapies. And uh, this has been really a game changing during COVID-19. However, we could see that immune therapies are not affordable because of the high pricing that have been uh, a really an issue to many countries. So it was limited to certain countries who can afford it. So I think uh, thinking about the global governance and preparedness, immune therapies should be really part of the priority areas for the discussions in addition to vaccinations because they are easier in terms of the manufacturing and faster in terms of mobilization and uh, effectiveness for the high risk uh, affected groups. So immunotherapies, uh, really uh, are very important part of the discussion. Uh, I think uh, also talking about innovation and research, research is very important because we need to uh, uh, not uh, stop in terms of accelerating research. Time was a critical during COVID and our governance in terms of the research uh, approvals and the prioritizations are really very slow that are not matching the need, the global need. So we need to uh, talk collectively on how best we can uh, um, revise the governance systems and revise our research regulations to accelerate research and to uh, align our research 
such priorities to the risks that we have in terms of the uh, um, global uh, health security um, to, to the world. Uh, the last point that I would like cover, uh, to cover is related to surveillance. And I believe that we have really historically been working uh, uh, closely at international government to define uh, the surveillance requirements across the globe. However, I think our surveillance uh, needs uh, need to be revised in terms of being more comprehensive. We had a lot, many uh, disease-based surveillance systems that are uh, really defined well at the global community, but it's not covering all the risks that we have. So we need to do a risk assessment in terms of what are the potential risks in terms of the future pandemics and what how we can enhance our surveillance systems to be more comprehensive, more integrated, and more adaptive to the new technologies to support our preparedness in the future. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for, uh, for uh, bringing uh, the issue of research. We're talking of regionalization and decentralization of manufacturing capacity, but obviously research is, a, is an essential component. Can I now turn to you, Jacques, for a few thoughts? Again, as I said, from an informed outsider, if you, you allow uh, me to call you that way. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Thierry, for the invitation. And just a caveat to state the fact that views expressed here are my own and not involving any organization with which I uh, collaborate. Um, just a few excerpts from my daily medical literature uh, review uh, over the last few weeks. Um, two weeks ago, the FDA approved uh, the most expensive drug ever, 3.5 million per patient, to treat uh, hemophilia B, a very rare disorder, and uh, which uh, affects just uh, a few uh, patients. Um, at the same time, almost at the same time, in the wake of COP27, uh, 230 medical journals published an editorial calling for uh, urgent action, urgent climate action in the interest of healthcare, pointing out the terrible increase in the burden of uh, disease induced by global heating, mostly in poor countries. And The Lancet added a comment stating that many countries still provide subsidies to fossil energy, uh, which are potentially higher than the health budget. So we see that governance uh, may be improved. And, and finally, there was a flurry of articles uh, criticizing health governance, culminating with a very good article dat dating back to February uh, this year by uh, Jean Pisani Ferry and, uh, and the Bruegel team. And the title is uh, explicit it says, uh, Health Governance, a Forensic Analysis. So, uh, is uh, governance really dead? Uh, I think it is not. Uh, I'm not going into the history of WHO the creation back in uh, 1948, the uh, uh, declaration of Altma Atta back in 1978, then uh, Astana declaration in, in 2018, calling for the rollout of universal uh, health coverage in line with sustainable development goals. But, but I do think that, uh, I mean, uh, although WHO has been criticized uh, uh, for, I mean, mostly for uh, political reasons, um, it, it did a good job with uh, former pandemics. Uh, the globalization did a good job by, because it really took number, uh, millions of people out of poverty and, and improved the healthcare system, the healthcare, sorry. So, uh, so I think uh, criticism is, uh, is uh, certainly uh, in excess. Also, there are a number of, uh, of levels for uh, additional governance. The regulatory governance works very well. You know, agencies collaborate, and we've seen how efficient they have been uh, to uh, approve new uh, vaccines. Um, there is a level of international governance which uh, has an influence of healthcare and which is heavily criticized, which pertains to intellectual property and uh, which has to do with sovereignty, with uh, science, uh, with scientific policy, with economic policy, and certainly will uh, have to address this in later uh, panels, but, but I have no time today. And uh, then we all know that all countries do try to uh, have a governance of the health system with very varied means, 
but which all resolve to cost containment. There are other angles of governance, uh, moral or intellectual, scientific societies doing a very good job in their discipline to kind of disseminate good practice uh, based on, uh, on, on, on science. Uh, but by definition, they have no mandate to, uh, prior to propose to prioritize between uh, various disciplines. Uh, stock markets exercise a governance on, uh, on health uh, product and technology manufacturers, but they have an obvious bias, which is shareholders' interests. And finally, we have philanthropic and humanitarians, uh, humanitarians on the terrain who, who too often have to establish a governance of their own because, I mean, they really have to do a triage between uh, uh, immediate calls. So how to improve the, uh, the edifice? Well, my plea is that before thinking of structure, we need to really agree on metrics because it's very difficult to measure healthcare. Actually, once you've gone out from, from mortality, it's very difficult. Um, then I would really encourage institutions to agree on objectives and to submit those objectives to, uh, to uh, uh, democratic criticism and debate because it always ends up in allocating <coughs> too scarce resources. And so the need for the population to accept this is, uh, is very important. Um, I would certainly uh, advise to um, governments to you know, relinquish the power in, in healthcare to health professionals, because my, my 30 years experience actually with uh, healthcare is that it's much easier to turn a doctor, uh, to teach a doctor in economics or mathematics or management than to take a lay person, uh, a kind of an administrative or a business person and uh, teach them medicine. So, uh, and, and, and very often the power in, in countries uh, in terms of managing budgets is far too much in the hands of uh, the administration and not enough in the hands of the, uh, of the physicians. And as mentioned, I'm not a physician but I, I love the physicians. So my, my prescriptions in uh, summary to uh, kind of uh, keep time uh, in line. Um, once again, work on metrics. I mean, really measuring health is a difficult issue and uh, reinforce epidemiology. Uh, I think uh, epidemiology is a science at the crossroad of uh, mathematics and uh, medicine and it's essential to really understand I mean, and, and propose the appropriate metrics. Uh, educate the population. I think this was mentioned in the previous panel. And, and because the, the choices are so difficult, we need to educate the population. Uh, turn the power to uh, health professionals. And finally, I would definitely advocate for decentralization and turn the power in as much as possible to local players because they often know better than the people who are in the offices, in the central offices. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Jacques. So now um, I must confess I have a problem because we started this session 10, 15 minutes late and I'm told that we have to stick to the um, schedule and therefore we have no time, unfortunately, for discussion. Uh, apologies, because I was looking forward to a discussion. So um, with apologies, please uh, let me just uh, give um, a very short conclusion from what I've heard in the previous and in this session. One, the world is not better prepared today, December 2022, to face a new pandemic as uh, compared or hardly better prepared than it was in 2020. Second, a number of processes have started. Many of these processes, including the negotiation of a treaty, the negotiation of a new global health strategy in Europe, the negotiation of a political resolution at the UN General Assembly are slow, cumbersome, as, as Anders said, and yet, as many of you have said, including um, Lionel, when it comes to some of the regional innovations, um, these processes are opening new, encouraging perspectives. <coughs> Third, there, is a, there are two key issues in global health that we and preparedness, pandemic preparedness and response that 
we still not uh, have clarity on. One is governance, and the second is the financing. And clearly, the uh, international financing facility, as it's called, that was recently established, is far from being where we would like it to be. And my last point is that I hope that as a public of the World Policy Conference, uh, you realize that health is not just anymore about health. Health of, is, of course, on the health agenda, but it is on the development agenda, it's on Climate. the global security agenda, it's on the economic agenda, it's on the social justice agenda, and as we heard from Christian and the One Health issue, is it's on the agenda of all of the interrelated crises uh, in which to which the world is currently confronted. So with that, please join me in thanking our panelists for this session. I like to comment in terms of um, matrix. And this